everyone, and welcome to the Joe Stein for President campaign's press conference this morning. Uh, my name is Melissa Figueroa. I am the press director for the Jill Stein for President campaign. Um, we will be starting in just a moment. And um, uh, are there any quick questions before we begin in terms of press or logistics? No? OK, great. And with no further ado, fresh from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where we were witnessing um, the damage from the floods and helping to recover, here is Green Party presidential nominee, Jill Stein. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. And thank you all so much for being here today. Really appreciate your attention to these very critical issues that are converging now in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but which are really symptomatic of a crisis across the country. Um, so first, uh, I just want to say a quick word about Baton Rouge, and in particular, Denham Springs, where we've just uh, returned from, and we had the honor of being uh, escorted through some of the most uh, most tragically struck areas of Baton Rouge, where essentially there has been no recovery and uh, almost nothing in the way of services. From the point of view of the residents uh, in Denham Springs, at least in the neighborhood that we were able to see, uh, this is another case of very unequal recovery. In fact, one of the residents of the shelter that we visited uh, was actually a displaced person from, uh, from Katrina and from New Orleans who had never been able to return to New Orleans because the recovery there was also uh, a case of unequal recovery. Um, and their feeling was that the services on the part of FEMA and on the part of the nonprofits just weren't coming to their neighborhood, whether you were talking about uh, help gutting their homes, uh, food relief, uh, services with laundry just to be able to wash their uh, filthy uh, materials. Uh, and just help trying to salvage their precious uh, memories and uh, lifetime possessions. We saw out on the street not only furniture, uh, bedding, uh, cabinets, uh, uh, walls, and so on, but the mementos of their, their lives and of their, of their children, including sports trophies and um, photos and things of that sort. So this was clearly a, um, a very wrenching moment for them. Uh, they felt incredible strength and courage from the uh, generosity of the community. One of the women we spoke to there had been staying uh, in a neighbor's house who had taken in 22 people uh, that were displaced on their street. And uh, we were hosted there by the um, Louisiana Green Party and their connections to uh, some of the uh, impacted people and also to many of the nonprofit groups, including Together Baton Rouge, uh, North Baton Rouge Disaster Relief, the Mutual Aid Disaster Relief, and also 510 Denham Springs, which is a GoFundMe uh, effort to help support some of the neighbors trying to salvage their homes. Also, um, yeah, uh, those were the main groups that we were working with. Um, and their resilience and their strength and their optimism was really incredible. Uh, it's of interest that the shelter we visited, uh, the LM Lockhart Center, was not an official shelter because there aren't enough official shelters to go around. The shelter was housing, really a community center, was housing 12 families. Um, including some who had previously been displaced in Katrina, as I mentioned. And it's also of interest that one of the people who uh, helped get that shelter going was General Honoré, who was the uh, in charge of the, uh, of the federal relief effort, um, uh, the state or federal 
um, military who had come in and finally had brought order to the New Orleans relief effort. And here he was kind of doing the same thing on a smaller scale uh, in Baton Rouge. And as, as you probably know, there are something like 100,000 people who have filed for federal relief and that many of the people, most of the people, I think, uh, were not covered by insurance because this wasn't a flood zone. Um, so just looking at the larger sense of this, we have a climate emergency that is really taking place, uh, you know, in the headlines all over the country right now. Both the, uh, the floods, which aren't limited only to Louisiana, but we've seen the recent floods uh, in, uh, in Arizona, in West Virginia, in Texas, uh, we are seeing 500 year, some people call them thousand year floods from these extremely heavy rains uh, that are uh, undoubtedly related to climate change. Any one storm cannot be definitively pegged to climate change, but when you see so many uh, at such extreme levels, there's uh, no question, according to the scientists, that this is a consequence of warmer air that holds much more water, and when it's triggered to downpour, it really flows. Um, and as you know, it's not just uh, the floods, it's also the drought. Uh, the heat waves that we've seen across much of the country, and the fires uh, on the West Coast, which at last count had displaced, what was it, some uh, 82,000 people had been evacuated uh, as of last week. Um, and then in addition, there are these growing warnings about sea level rise. Uh, according to James Hansen, the foremost climate scientist, we, um, they, he is predicting meters worth, that is yards worth, uh, not one yard, but many yards worth of sea level rise as soon as 50 years from now. Um, and that, of course, would be an absolutely devastating sea level rise that would essentially um, wipe out uh, coastal population centers, including the likes of uh, Manhattan and, uh, and Florida and so on, and actually all over the world, the entire country of Bangladesh. So this is not uh, something we want to continue charging headlong towards. And we know that even under the so-called all of the above climate plan of the Obama administration, that uh, greenhouse gases have not just been rising, but the rate of rise has actually been accelerating. Um, so this is why, you know, we call for uh, essentially declaring a climate state of emergency, recognizing that we are facing civilization threatening um, events now, and the time window to prevent them is closing rapidly. This isn't something that can wait 50 years. If we're going to stop it, we need to stop now because there's a long delay uh, in the impact of those greenhouse gases, even the ones that are already there. Um, and this, uh, I'll, I'll talk about our, our solution, I'll summarize it very briefly in a moment, but I just want to point out early here that this underscores why we think an open debate is absolutely critical in this election. There will otherwise not be a candidate who is not taking money from the lobbyists, the corporations, uh, super PACs, et cetera. We're the only such campaign uh, that is not compromised by the power of big money, the uh, big banks, the fossil fuel giants, the war profiteers. We are the only uh, clean, people-powered campaign in this election, so we have the unique ability to actually tell the truth here, uh, not only about climate change, about the endless and expanding wars that are making us less secure, not more secure, while they cost us over half of our discretionary budget and about half of your income taxes, yet we only uh, make the terrorist threat bigger with each turn of the cycle of violence. So there are a number of interrelated issues here where we have the unique ability to tell the truth. In an election where we're seeing just unprecedented realignment with the Republican Party essentially uh, unraveling at the seams uh, with many 
prominent Republicans now supporting Hillary Clinton, with Hillary Clinton appealing to the Republicans to come into her big tent with her um, transition uh, director uh, uh, being one of the lobbyists' lobbyists, uh, who is very close to the fossil fuel industry, supports the Keystone Pipeline, uh, supports the Trans-Pacific Partnership, et cetera. You know, we think there's a clear signal here of the Democratic Party continuing to move to the right, uh, leaving not only the Bernie Sanders supporters uh, out in the cold, but so much of the American public at a time when polls tell us that over half of Americans, something like 57 percent, are are very dissatisfied with their two choices. A recent uh, AP NORC poll about a month ago found that 13 percent of the American public was satisfied with the two-party approach to the presidential election. 13 percent that are satisfied. So we think at a time when we are facing really critical issues in an election where we're not just deciding what kind of a world we will have, but whether we will have a world or not going forward. Uh, we think it's really critical uh, now more than ever that we have an open debate and actually put more choices in front of the American people who are clamoring for those choices. And then just a quick word about uh, a solution here to this crisis. And essentially we're saying we've got to declare the state of emergency that we have, um, and that emergency is compounded by existing racial disparities and economic disparities that put the most vulnerable on the front lines of the climate crisis as well as on the front lines of the economic crisis. So we call for a joint solution that solves these two problems. The economic recovery has come to those on the top, but not to most Americans. Uh, particularly uh, yeah, younger Americans who have essentially been hung out to dry here uh, in a system in which they are held hostage by uh, staggering levels of debt that are unpayable in the current economy and that have uh, the climate crisis uh, ex essentially exploding on their watch. Um, so we call for a solution here that addresses both the economic and the climate crisis. We call it a Green New Deal. So it's not a hypothetical. It's based on something we actually did in the Great Depression that helped us get out of it. Uh, and that is a, an emergency jobs program that would create 20 million jobs, ensuring that every American who can work and wants to work has a decent paying job, a living wage job, as part of this emergency mobilization, uh, which we also call a wartime scale mobilization. When Pearl Harbor was bombed at the outset of the Second World War for the United States, it took us six months, all of six months, to massively mobilize our economy. We went from zero percent on a wartime footing to 25 percent on a wartime footing of GDP uh, in the course of six months. So clearly we can do this. We can mobilize. And we're calling for 100 percent clean renewable energy by 2030, which is what the science tells us uh, is exactly what we need if we are to hold uh, temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees centigrade and essentially uh, turn the tide on climate change. Uh, we would be creating jobs, particularly in the areas of clean renewable energy, that is wind, water, sun, conservation and efficiency, uh, but also in the area of healthy and sustainable local food production, because that's a major component of greenhouse gases, um, and also public transportation uh, that is energy efficient, renewably powered, and that um, uh, dovetails with what we call recreational transportation. We have a right to recreation as a form of transportation. That is safe bike paths and sidewalks so that we can actually use our muscle power as part of how we get to uh, transit hubs. Um, now the good news about this is that it not only restarts the economy, it um, turns the tide on climate change, it also makes the wars for oil obsolete when you have 100 uh, percent clean renewable energy uh, for the uh, foreseeable future. Um, so therein is how it pays for itself through two mechanisms. And the first I'll mention has actually been uh, uh, 
articulated in very detailed engineering studies how we get so much healthier, and I can say this under authority as a medical doctor, we get so much healthier when we do away with the uh, air pollution and its various sequela into our water and into our, our uh, aquatic food chain and so on. Uh, when we do away with those fossil fuel exposures, which by the way, cause 200,000 premature deaths in this country every year, 200,000, and make major contributions to the epidemic of asthma, to heart attacks, to strokes, and to cancer. So when you actually do the numbers on this and you look at the contribution of fossil fuels to this public health burden, it turns out we get so much healthier when we zero out fossil fuels that our savings in healthcare expenditures is actually enough to pay pay the costs of the transition over approximately a decade and a half, according to um, uh, one of the prominent studies here. So it's, um, uh, it pays for itself in terms of health benefits, but also if you then factor in the reductions in our military expenditures, our bloated and dangerous military, which is not making us safer but demonstrably less safe, uh, if we cut that military budget, uh, that too puts hundreds of billions of dollars uh, into the money that we need in order to uh, undertake this Green New Deal. So essentially, it is a win-win-win for our economy, for our climate, for our health, and another one for peace and international security. Um, a couple other just real quick mentions. We also call for a just transition that, that ensures both workers in the industry and communities, like in coal country, for example, that, uh, that they will not lose jobs until those jobs are replaced or there will be transition support, uh, as the state of New York, for example, adopted recently in their phasing out uh, of their coal plants. They assured their workers of comparable uh, financial and financial support and benefit coverage for a period of two years. We would be looking at a longer period than two years, um, and yeah, and that's you know I'll, I'll leave it at that um, and I'll op open it up to your questions. Just underscoring that we're really at a critical moment of transition here uh, on the climate, uh, as well as on related issues, including. Uh, global conflicts, which very often are related, in fact, to f access to fossil fuels and their routes of transportation. So we're at a, you know, at a, um, you know, kind of a, a Hail Mary moment here where we uh, very critically need to change course. We need to have an open and honest discussion about what we're actually facing, particularly our younger generation, uh, which has been held hostage uh, not only by a predatory economy, a predatory system of student loans and public higher education, but also by the full weight of the climate crisis that is falling on their heads. And I would mention, by the way, that the number of young people who are locked into student loan debt, which is essentially unpayable for most people, um, and it's not just young people, it's now well into middle age. That's 43 million people trapped by student loan debt. That right there is enough to win a three-way presidential race because 43 million is a plurality uh, in the presidential vote. That's a lot of people uh, who could be mobilized. So uh, when I'm asked, well, you know, aren't you just going to spoil the election? I make the point that, you know, we're looking at some pretty serious stuff here. The American people are, are at a unique moment in history. We have never had such a uh, majority support for uh, truly transformative change. The American people are uh, unhappy uh, distrust and dislike the two major party presidential candidates. This is not a time for the political pundits and the party operatives to be telling the American people to be good little boys and girls and just keep voting for the same two parties that have uh, demonstrably thrown people under the bus. We think it's really important for us to have that open uh, conversation and for my campaign and actually Gary Johnson's campaign uh, to be on the ballot. There are four candidates, I'm sorry, to be in the debates. There are four candidates in this election that will be on the ballot for just about every American voters. In America, we have a right not only to our vote, we have a right to know who it is that we can vote for. I'll open it up there. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>
So, uh, Dave Wagga, Washington Post, you are taking uh, public financing. Every other major candidate has pulled out of that system. It seems to be collapsing. Um, one, what would you say the Green Party is entitled to public financing because of it, it's not gotten that much support in previous elections? And two, would you favor expanding the matching limit? I mean, there's a proposal in Congress to make it six to one for mm -hmm. each dollar in the system. So, you know, I think you could you could um, bounce that question to the American people. Do they think we should just have the same, the same two? You know, they're, they're screaming, no. And, you know, we're seeing the Republican Party unravel, and we're seeing the Democratic Party move to the right. We have one demo-Republican big corporate party right now, and the American people uh, are tired of being thrown under the bus. They are sick of a rigged economy, and they're sick of the rigged political system that delivers it. Yes, I would say absolutely, and, you know, what we call for is not simply expanding uh, the the ceiling for public funding. We're talking about uh, publicly funded elections, period. Our, our democracy is too important to be privatized and put into the hands of uh, big money, either big money donors or big money candidates. One should not be able to buy influence in our democracy at a time when we are, f I mean, ever, but especially now, when we're really looking our mortality in the face here, whether you're looking at the consequences of blowback from these uh, catastrophic wars, whether you're looking at the climate meltdown, uh, the next, um, um, uh, you know, the next meltdown of our economy, which continues to teeter on the brink. The banks are bigger than ever and more prone to fail as ever. Um, and, uh, you know, just look at the new nuclear arms race, uh, where Barack Obama basically said a trillion dollars on a whole new generation of nuclear weapons. We should be in the process of rapidly, um, uh, you know, disbanding, uh, retiring all nuclear weapons and uh, joining what looks to be coming out of the United Nations now, which is a new um, a, a call. Uh, essentially to ban nuclear weapons. The other nations of the world are now beginning to move outside of the nuclear nations who have neglected their responsibility to move towards uh, disarmament for too long. So, you know, that's the bandwagon that we need to get on. Next question. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Olemacher with the AP. Uh, what do you make of a presidential campaign that has in many ways devolved into uh, just a contest of personalities as opposed to a discussion of the issues. I think it speaks volumes about what's happened to our political system, you know, and this didn't just happen overnight. This is really where we've been going, and now we see it kind of at a new uh, horrifying extreme um, where, you know, the news becomes uh, the transitions inside of the Trump campaign. You know, really? Is that what we're talking about in this election? You know, changes of staff? You know, um, we, we have, you know, uh, our, our future is imperiled right now. And uh, there are more important things for us to be talking about. I think personally, you know, as someone who has struggled with this system for uh, many years, uh, first as a physician, you know, and then as a physician recognizing that we were not going to cure what ails us inside of this very sick political system, that if we want to, uh, you know, fix the things that are literally uh, threatening life, limb, and survival even, you know, we, we need to heal our uh, very um, pathological um, uh, political system. Uh, and, you know, I think in this election we're seeing that, uh, that political system reach its logical conclusion. You know, it is bought and paid for by big interests. We saw that in the Sanders campaign. You know, they could, they could raise up a principled agenda, but it was sabotaged like every other uh, principled rebel in the Democratic Party over the past many decades. They're allowed to be seen and heard for a little while, and then they get taken down and essentially disappeared. Uh, uh, you know, and in this case, disappeared out of the Democratic Convention. Bernie Sanders was relegated to a footnote, and then we saw the emails, of course, about how the uh, DNC had been working in collusion with Hillary's staff and with some members of, of the big media, you know, to sort of um, tilt the playing field in that direction. So, you know, this is a systemic problem, and uh, I think the disgust that the American people are feeling right now uh, has really reached breakthrough proportions. This is a realignment election. Uh, everyday people are looking for a new political voice that's not part of this compromised demo Republican Party. And I'd say hold on to your hat. There is a, a critical conversation that is waiting to be held. And once it begins, um, I think all bets are off about where it goes. If, if that's what you say is true, why aren't you doing better? 
Well, it may have something to do with the fact that, according to the New York Times, and this is now about three months ago, Donald Trump had gotten $2 billion worth of free media. Hillary Clinton had gotten $1 billion of free media. And uh, Bernie Sanders had had about half as much. And we've had essentially zero up until this past week when we have, you know, five minutes here and there, with the exception of the CNN town hall, where we were trending number one on Twitter. So, you know, I would say uh, every indication is that people are really hungry for more. Polls show right now that very few people have even heard of our campaign, and if they've heard of it, they have no idea what it represents. So, you know, I, I'd say to those who think that our campaign is too, um, you know, too uh, sort of um, uninteresting to the American public, you know, try us, you know. Let us, let us have that exposure out there. Bring us into a debate, and let's see what happens. Um, <clears throat> uh, two questions in terms of your practical hurdles. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the Commission on Presidential Debates, um, and their 15% criteria based on corporate polls. Um, and secondly, um, it uh, isn't part of the issue, uh, by the way, Sam Husseini with votepack.org. Yes, thank you. Um, it, it isn't part of the issue that some people who agree with you are effectively driving down your numbers. I mean, Noam Chomsky is basically telling people climate change, the very issue that you talked about, uh, Trump is a climate denier, you can't, you got to vote for Clinton in so-called swing states. Um, how do you get past that hurdle when people who presumably agree with you on the issues are effectively driving down your numbers? Um, so let me take that in two pieces. First, about the Commission on Presidential Debates. You know, the League of Women Voters, when they quit, and the commission came in and basically took over. The League of Women Voters quit because they said this is a fraud being perpetrated on the American public basically because of the inordinate power of the commission, which is essentially representatives of the Democratic and Republican parties. It's the two parties essentially controlling the debates in order to silence political opposition. You know, so this is not what uh, democracy looks like in the first place. But they quit, the League quit, saying that the commission had essentially granted themselves the power to control the questioning because of their control over the questioner, uh, uh, control over the candidates who were eligible, and control over the audience so that they could create the illusion that there is popular support for, you know, things like more corporate tax breaks or the Trans-Pacific Partnership or, uh, you know, these uh, expanding wars. You know, they can basically, uh, you know, create the movie to make it look like there's popular support. Um, so we consider the commission illegitimate. It is not a public commission and its name is uh, very deceptive. And we think that 15 percent uh, is a dis service to the American public, especially at a time when people are saying that uh, they are extremely unhappy with the two choices uh, and with the two political parties in the presidential election. We think that there should be another basis for inclusion, and that is the right of voters to know about who their choices are, and that any candidate who is on the ballot in enough states that they could numerically win the election, voters have a right to know about those candidates. Um, and we will, you know, we have challenged in the court of law without great expectations that that was going to go anywhere, and it hasn't. But there is still the court of public opinion. Uh, in my home state in Massachusetts, we have been able to fight our way into debates, actually, in which. Uh, uh, I did very well, and the public had enormous resonance with what they heard, and then I was yanked out of the debates because it became clear that a, a public interest point of view is a grave threat to the political establishment. But there are tools and um, strategies that we will be using. Thousands of people are signing up, and I encourage uh, you know anyone who's interested to go to jill2016.com and sign up to be a part of the campaign to open the debates. I don't think the American people are going to take this one sitting down. In the last election, my running mate and I were arrested simply for trying to get into the grounds of the college where a debate was being held. And I think there will be, um, you know, uh, in the future, there, we won't be going alone.
in terms of people driving down your numbers who uh, have some Okay, fear? yes. Well, this politics of fear that tells you you have to vote against what you're afraid of rather than for what you truly believe. So Noam Chomsky has supported me in my home state, you know, when he felt safe to do so. Um, I think it's fair to say my agenda is far closer to his than, than Hillary Clinton, you know, but he subscribes to the politics of fear. Um, and, you know, maybe there's a generational difference here, um, but I think young people growing up today do not see the Democratic Party as the party of the New Deal. Uh, they also don't see it as the party that's going to save us. They see it as the party of fracking. They see it as the party of opening up the Arctic uh, that pushed for the Trans-Pacific Pipeline until they were forced by the grassroots to stop. They see it as the party of expanding wars and drone uh, assassinations. They see it as the party of um, uh, immigrant deportations and detentions and night raids. So Donald Trump says uh, terrifying things. Hillary Clinton actually has a extremely troubling record uh, from leading the charge into the catastrophe of Libya to saying, send them home to the children fleeing the violence in Latin America, which she herself had a hand in by giving the thumbs up to the coup in Honduras, ushering in that incredible violence from which you know tens of thousands are fleeing one of the major um, uh, you know, uh, influxes of refugees. So, um, you know, and Hillary has been a major proponent of fracking around the world and now has just appointed Ken Salazar, you know, the best friend of fracking uh, to her transition team. So the climate is not looking so good under a Hillary Clinton administration. And coal is terrible, but the science on fracking says that it's probably just as bad. It's not okay to open up an entirely new generation of infrastructure now that's going to wed us to fracking for, you know, another 20, 30, or 40 years. It's basically, you know, curtains the minute we do that. So I think there are many people now who take a different point of view um, and who recognize that the politics of fear delivered everything we were afraid of. All the reasons you were told to vote for the lesser evil, because you didn't want the meltdown of the climate, the expanding wars, the offshoring of our jobs, all those things, all those reasons we were given to vote for the lesser evil is exactly what we've gotten. Um, democracy needs a moral compass. It's not enough to vote against. We need an affirmative agenda, especially at a time when there are enough people that we can actually drive that agenda forward. We could potentially win this race. I'm not holding my breath, but I'm not ruling it out. This is a crazy election. It's not over till it's over. Uh, Jason Calvi with EWT and the Global Catholic Network. Uh, want to get your, uh, I want to get your thoughts on the you mentioned access of uh, money and accessing politicians. What are your thoughts on the latest batch of Hillary Clinton emails in the State Department? What do those reveal about access? What do yes. you think about that? And what should Americans be thinking about that? Exactly. I mean, I think it's not a coincidence that you know that Hillary has the numbers that she has as one of the most untrusted. Uh, presidential candidates ever. And the more we see of what went on in the Secretary of State's office, uh, which Hillary attempted to um, cover up, you know, to sort of take off the record by using her private server. I mean, this is sort of the elephant in the room around the private server. Why did she put uh, national security information and the names of of uh, CIA secret agents. Why were they put at risk? She was clear about this, and the uh, Inspector General's report um, about the emails actually makes this point, that this wasn't a mistake. This was by intention, and Hillary told her staff she did not want uh, her uh, personal business uh, to be accessible to FOIAs, for example. But this is the really disturbing thing. Where did her personal family financial business end and where did the uh, official business of the state begin? To me, the mere fact that half of her emails, half of the volume and the number of her emails, she classified as private. If someone is on the job and half of their emails are for their private affairs, there's something wrong here. You know, either the private is, uh, you know, leaking over into the public or someone is doing their own private business on company time. 
So, you know, to my mind, um, the continuing revelations about the influence of the uh, Clinton campaign donors, the special deals that they got, the lucrative favors, the weapons deals, for example, to Saudi Arabia, who we're now seeing, you know, <laughs> Uh, all else aside, but just looking at Yemen alone, uh, the incredible war crimes being committed by Saudi Arabia with our weapons, not to mention our assistance, uh, this is really a national scandal. And the fact that money was flowing to the Clinton Foundation as these uh, very uh, regrettable and harmful decisions were being made, I think regardless of the legality, this just raises uh, serious questions about judgment and character that, in my view, are just not compatible with uh, someone that you want to trust uh, as the leader of the country. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Dana Milbank with the uh, Washington Post ver uh, segment of the corporate media. Um, so I have a conundrum I want to uh, present uh, to you. Mm -hmm. So um, I could write about today, and others could report here, about what a, an important issue climate change is. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'd publish it or broadcast it. And the, the fact is, very few people will read it. Uh, and they're going to go uh, read or, or view uh, stories about uh, Trump's staff machinations or Clinton's email. So I'm not sure the issue is necessarily a, a corporate media, but what people are demanding. Why is that? What's the, what's the way around that, if there is one? Well, let me say, um, We've seen this problem get worse, you know, worse and worse. Um, I think it's a multi-factor uh, problem. But what we do know is that when we had um, greater diversity of candidate opinion, there is an opportunity to have a more diverse discussion. Right now, so many people are tuned out of the election and out of the political system in general because they are accustomed to being ignored by that system and because, you know, not only ignored by the discussion but ignored by the agenda. The agenda really, you know, was Bernie Sanders tuned out? I don't think so. You know, I think he had more attention from the American public than just about anyone, at least from my point of view, outside of the Democratic Party. It looked to me like uh, he was, you know, the, um, you know, the, the guy uh, saying that the emperor had no clothes and everyone was agreeing with him. Even Trump supporters were agreeing with him. You know, remember that polls show that the majority of Trump supporters are not motivated by supporting Trump. They're motivated by not liking Hillary Clinton. So let's give them another choice besides Donald Trump as an alternative to Hillary Clinton. Let's have a more diverse discussion. I think the more we have diverse media outlets, uh, the better, the more that media has been consolidated, the harder it's been to have a truly uh, diverse and open discussion. So those are some of the things that I would fix going forward. But I think it's not rocket science. We did have a very open discussion just a few months ago because we had a candidate uh, who was engaging a whole other body of voters. And even that was very early in the campaign. As we get closer, I think the power of advocating for jobs, you know, for the right to a job, for canceling student debt, that's going to spread like a wildfire. We have. Now, you know, we're running between four and six, even seven percent in the polls. Prior to any big media coverage, that doesn't usually happen. Why is that happening? You know, in my view, that's because there is a, a generation here which is really desperate for another way forward. They're networked on the internet, and that word is getting out. Uh, if we could get to four, five, and six percent without any coverage, uh, you know, I think all bets are off as to what will happen uh, when we get into the debates. More questions? Yeah. I guess um, down the ballot, there are going to be a lot of people voting who have you at the top of the ticket but don't have a green candidate for Congress, a green candidate for governor, state school board, et cetera. Um, would you recommend they vote for one party in particular if, if they're voting, voting for you? What would advance the goals that you're running off? You know, I would say to look carefully at the candidate, um, you know. Um, and don't just look at what they say, because if you look at what they say, there's very little difference between, you know, according to some uh, online, uh, you know, candidate uh, informational uh, sites, 
there's not much difference between Hillary Clinton and myself. But, you know, that's if you take what Hillary Clinton said as what Hillary Clinton will do rather than looking at Hillary Clinton's record. So I think it's really important to look at the record of the candidate who's funding them, you know, the usual. But you'd be surprised um, how many uh, green candidates there are actually running for Congress, for Senate, uh, for state offices, uh, for city councils, et cetera. Uh, we have a lot of down ballot candidates, and I would just say that you know if if uh, the uh, black swan event were to happen, you know, in this age of black swans, and we wound up in the White House, I think we would find a lot of people uh, ready to move with this agenda inside of the Democratic Party who feel like they've been held hostage by you know prevailing politics. Yeah, um, after what we saw in the internal process, both in the uh, Democratic and Republican Party, uh, with suggestions of internal crisis in both parties, mm -hmm. one would think that, uh, you know, that would be a good thing for, you know, minor parties like yours mm -hmm. to get some terrain to, 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 to look more appealing to American voters. Mm -hmm. But not, that not seems to be the case. How do you explain this, I don't know, you call it irrational yes. scenario? Yes. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that people haven't heard about our campaigns and they don't know who we are. Uh, the New York Times uh, did a study about two or three months ago, which I may have mentioned before, before you came in, I think. Oh, that's all right. But um, it bears repeating um, that the, uh, at the time, Months ago, Donald Trump had received $2 billion worth of free coverage. Hillary Clinton, $1 billion. Bernie Sanders, about half as much. And we had received essentially zip, yet we are still running 4 to 6% in the polls without any coverage, which is pretty unprecedented in our history. Uh, when, we did, when we had our first you know, uh, peak below the curtain, uh, or when the curtain came up briefly on CNN for a full hour actually longer than that, town hall meeting last week. We were uh, trending number one on Twitter. We were number two on Nielsen ratings. There was every indication that people were really hungering for more. So what would you, what would you think it would be necessary for Pilot like you oh, to I, gain more, more uh, we are We are hoping to uh, begin some more town hall meetings on primetime TV uh, to hold more town hall forums with myself and uh, possibly with my running mate, so that you know we can actually be seen and heard by the American public. Because right now they don't have a clue who we are or even that we exist. I think the name of the game is all about empowering the American voter for what they are demanding right now, which is more voices and more choices. They don't like who they've got. So I think just by empowering the American voter to, to be the driver here in our democracy and in our election, uh, you know, that's what we have to do. And, you know, and, and let the chips fall where they may. But we've got to start with a inclusive and open democratic discussion. If we can't have it now, while we're looking our mortality in the face, uh, and the American people are saying, this stinks, if we cannot change the discussion now, you know, when, in heaven's name, are we ever going to change it? It's got to be now. <coughs> um, Two more questions, and then we'll go to closing remarks. OK, great. Uh, so let's we'll take people who are um, yeah. Jason, and, uh, and then uh, if no one else has spoken, I'll um, you mentioned how racial disparities play a role in who ends up at the front lines of the climate crisis. I was wondering if you could expand on that in relation to your experience in Louisiana. In Louisiana? Sure. I mean, Louisiana was like, what we saw was kind of like uh, instant replay in, um, in Katrina, you know, where so many of those hit hardest you know, were poor people and uh, communities of color, neighborhoods of color. Not only that they were hit hard, but that the relief didn't come. And even years later, the relief didn't come. So uh, when I was there in New Orleans for the 10-year anniversary, the numbers uh, at that time reflected that about half of the African-American population had not been able to return, even 10 years later, because that's not where the rebuilding happened. It's not where the salvage happened. And we could see that in the neighborhood where we were walking and driving through, that these were largely families of color um, that were just helping each other. 
and uh, where volunteers were coming in. Uh, the Green Party was mobilizing from around the state to help people out uh, because, um, you know, because the needed relief just wasn't coming. So, um, you know, people were very worried. And there we were seeing refugees from Katrina that were there in the shelter. And that shelter, by the way, was not even an official shelter, so it's not receiving support from FEMA. It's not getting drop-offs of supplies and food because it's not a recognized shelter. So, you know, and it wasn't just Katrina, it was also Superstorm Sandy, where it was com poor communities and uh, African-American and Latino communities that are um, you know, really the first to get hit and the last to get helped. Uh, so we see really a compounding of a crisis of racial justice, you know, together with a crisis of, of the climate and the environment. So it's very important that we fix them both, and we need attention to both. Along those lines, I want to just mention briefly in solidarity with the, um, uh, with the North Dakota Sioux, um, the, yes, the Standing Rock Sioux, uh, in North Dakota who are trying to protect their land as another disenfranchised group, another, uh, you know, people of color, uh, who are trying to save their water supply, their traditional lands, uh, as well as the climate. Uh, we've always relied really on indigenous people to be the caretakers of our climate and of our ecosystem, and they are basically uh, resisting now another uh, very toxic um, pipeline of um, the worst kind of fuel that's going to run over their water supply and put their lands very much at risk. And I just want to stand in solidarity with them. There are about a thousand Native Americans that have gathered now uh, at their uh, at their tribal lands in an effort to resist the pipeline. And what they're doing is trying to help prevent the next uh, Katrina, the next Superstorm Sandy, uh, the next Louisiana floods um, down the line because they're only getting worse and more frequent and more devastating. Uh, they exemplify, I think, the kind of courage and the foresight that we need and the kind of community spirit that we need in order to stop this uh, crisis from barreling down on us, which it is right now. Thank you. Oh, Hi, Dr. Stein. Hi, um, When we spoke yesterday, you talked about the need for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Yes. And I wondered if you could expand Great. on that. Great, thank you. And I think this pertains not only to the issue of environmental racism, uh, to the issue of police violence, uh, to the issue of xenophobia as well, for that matter, that we are a country um, uh, really uh, that's uh, armed and ready to shoot, you know, and we are the most violent country uh, in the world. Um, with the most uh, shootings and violent deaths, on, you know, at the hands of police, but beyond the hands of police as well. And we have a violence problem which goes hand in hand with our problem of fear and um, mistrust uh, and hate. Unfortunately, we're seeing the, uh, those flames uh, being you know, uh, fanned right now in this election. The, fan, the, the flames of hate and fear are being intensified where we need to be moving in the opposite direction. We need to be having a facilitated discussion now. We need to be able to have a frank discussion about race, about the legacy of racism, uh, about in particular, you know, many people say, oh, slavery, it ended. Well, it ended, but then it became lynchings, and then it became Jim Crow, and then it became redlining, and then it became um, segregation, which is coming back full force, the war on drugs, mass incarceration, uh, and then this police violence, which is really just the tip of an iceberg. So, you know, there's, there's a deep underlying problem here. Um, and it's not only the, the culture of policing and the broken windows policing that creates very aggressive policing. The culture of that has to be changed, and the training of our police has to be changed. Communities need to be put in charge of their police instead of having police in charge of their communities. So, you know, we need um, citizen review panels that have the power of subpoena and so on. We need to be able to hold perpetrators accountable through investigations of every death uh, at the hands of police. So there, there are things we need to do about that violence. but. 
we also need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And in my view, we also need uh, reparations to address this historic and compounded burden of uh, economic disparities. Um, so that violence is not only at the hands of uh, an occupying police force. Violence is also taking place economically right now. We know that just living while black uh, confers a seven-year loss of life. If you compound that with poor education, which also tends to run in communities of color, it's another seven years loss of life. So there are real consequences to the cumulative historic burden. Uh, you know, and it's not just African Americans. We need to look at the burden of discrimination, fear, and hate uh, against people of color immigrants, um, Latinos, uh, Muslims, uh, um, Native Americans, and so on. We need a facilitated discussion at the community level that includes um, art and music and storytelling and the things that enable us to humanize each other uh, to each other. Uh, this isn't rocket science. There is a whole you know, method for doing this, for helping us build trust and make friends and become a common community, which we must do if we are to solve any of the problems that we're currently struggling with. Thank you very much. Uh, we are just about at 11 o'clock, so I thank you all for coming. Um, if you haven't gotten a card from me, please see me if you would like an interview. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your attention. Thanks a lot. Live coverage of Green Party presidential nominee Jill Stein reviewing what she saw during a recent tour of Baton Rouge since the most recent storms hit the area. Also talking about recovery efforts underway, uh, touching on climate change and a number of other issues, including her candidacy for president. Jill Stein, of course, third party candidate. And we are opening the phone lines to get your take on the impact of third party candidates in this race. What's your likelihood of voting for a third party candidate? Numbers are on the screen. Republicans, 202-748-8921. Democrats, 202-748-8921. 8920. We have a separate line for members of the Green Party. It's 202-748-8923. And for all others, it's 202-748-8922. Again, receiving your phone calls on Jill Stein's candidacy for president and the impact of third-party candidates. Charlie Cook from the National Journal is running a story looking at the likelihood of the, uh, the likely turnout, that is, of the presidential election. He says that this presidential race seems to have stabilized to a point where the probability of Hillary Clinton beating Donald Trump is very high. But the margin is tough to predict, as is the rate of voter turnout. And he ends the story by saying demographically, Mr. Trump has painted himself into a corner. And that doesn't mean that there is no way for him to escape that corner, but it will require considerable athletic ability and agility to pull it off more than he now appears to have. You can read that entire story, again, written by Charlie Cook from the National Journal. And a quick note, if you missed any of what Jill Stein had to say, we will show it to you again shortly after we finish with your phone calls.
CNN reporting that uh, Donald Trump is postponing a major immigration speech that he was set to deliver Thursday in Colorado as his campaign continues to fine-tune his immigration policy. The decision, according to CNN, came after Mr. Trump, whose hardline immigration policies appealed to many Republican primary voters, met Saturday with his Hispanic Advisory Council, and he said in an interview yesterday morning that he wants to come up with a really fair but firm immigration policy. And to your calls now, a first call is uh, from Cedar Hill, Texas. Cedar Hill, Texas, on our All Others line. Oh, yes, hello. Go ahead. You're JC, correct? Correct. Go um, ahead, thanks sir. Thanks for taking my call. Mm -hmm. um, okay, regarding Jill Stein, um, I think she did a good job speaking today. Um, I can't, On the impact of third-party candidates, um, I'm actually supporting um, Governor Gary Johnson, um, um, but as I am a libertarian. But Jill Stein, she's definitely the second best candidate in the race. Um, I agree with her on social issues and, and among things like that. But I am staunchly opposed to our economic plan because it would bankrupt the American economy. Um, but, yeah, she's still a much better candidate than Hillary Clinton because she is good, because Hillary Clinton is a federal racketeer and Donald Trump. Um, I can't take Donald Trump seriously for one second as he is not a conservative and he does not stand for conservative values. So. Sorry to cut you off there. Uh, next to Willie in Malvern, Arkansas, on the Democrats line. Uh, hello? Yes, go ahead, Willie. I'd just like to thank you for taking my call. Mm -hmm. I uh, tuned late on Jill Stein there, but I, I will not be voting for a third-party candidate because I want my vote to count, and I don't think a third, 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 third uh, candidate will, third-party candidate will get in. They don't have the money, the funds, or the infrastructure to... Uh, anything, so I will be voting for Hillary Clinton. And thank you very much for taking my call. Thanks. Next to Christian in Lexington, Kentucky, calling on the Green Party's line. Yes, good morning. I think Jill was fantastic as always, and uh, many people have pointed out that Bernie started at 3%, just like Jill has, and she's moving steadily in the polls. A question for discussion. Um, the sugar and slavery uh, economy is basically pioneered uh, bonds. And Jill's last question was on restitution to uh, people of color communities. What if there was a one or two basis point um, charge to help fund education and community development on the seven trillion dollars worth of government bonds that are issued every year? That would translate into seven hundred billion. Uh, per bit, no, sorry, seven billion uh, dollars worth of um, funds available for education and like community per basis point. Just a thought. Margie is in Deltona, Florida, on the Republicans' line. Hi, thank you for C-SPAN. I have to say that first of all, if it weren't for C-SPAN, oh my God, I don't know what we would do with these. With the with the media in general, and I don't even just mean the liberal media, even Fox News, they just go so far right. But what I would like to say about Jill Stein, I am a diehard Trump supporter. Yes, I am, and I'm proud of it. But this lady is truly impressive, and I wish that the media were willing to give her and Gary Johnson and, and other candidates more airtime. Why can't we see all the candidates on display? And, and to me, that this 15 percent, you know, in the popular voting polls, that that's arbitrary. I mean, everybody's polls are, are skewed or they're all over the map. Let the, all four of these candidates on the stage together and then let us shop as consumers and let us hire the person that we want to hire. But again, I thank you for C-SPAN, and God bless you. Thank you. Another Green Party caller, Ed, is calling in from Rockford, Michigan. 
Ed, do we have Hello? you? Go ahead, sir. Yes, I'm calling from Grand Rapids, Greater Grand Rapids, Kent County, Michigan. And I've been a long-time blue-collar supporter of the Democrats. But this year, I'm going to vote for the Green Party because I think the Democratic Party has deserted me and the labor people. You know, we had three good General Motors plants in the greater Grand Rapids area, they're gone. We have still case a private large company. They have taken away all the the good benefits for their their uh, their employees. So you know, uh, I feel that uh, we're not going to come back with this economy. The good job, just like Ross Perot said, they're being sucked out of this country. And I voted for Bernie. I worked for Bernie Sanders. And we won Michigan. But you know what? Hillary got 20 more delegates votes for, for in the convention. And you know, those Democrat super delegates, the, the senators that I voted for, they're not going to receive my vote no longer. And thank you very much. Taking your calls on the impact of third-party candidates, up next is Adele from Brooklyn, New York. She's a Democrat. Yes, I am. Thank you so much, C-SPAN, for this opportunity to speak on the impact of the third-party candidates. I am a physician also, and I appreciated Dr. Stein's remarks. However, I am a strong supporter of Mrs. Clinton, and I hope she will win. We know that the third-party candidates usually hurt the Democratic candidate. We've seen this with Ralph Nader's campaigns, Ross Perot's campaigns, and we saw it repeatedly. So it's not a new issue. It's not something that's going to change because the system is functioning, has been functioning for 200 years, and will continue to function. I do hope that the people who are serious about having a woman president will support Mrs. Clinton. But I do wish Dr. Stein the best. I hope we can learn more about her background, her training, her education, and her political activism in the past. She is an impressive individual, and I thank C-SPAN for giving us really beautiful coverage of the political candidates, the conventions, and everything, because the public needs the information that your network is giving us for the road to the White House. I applaud you, and thank you for today. Mm Bye-bye. We'll stay on the East Coast and hear from Chris in Summers Point, New Jersey, on our Green Party line. Yes, hello. How are you guys doing today? Pretty good. All right, you know, I... I support Jill Stein, and um, I'm really getting tired of people saying third-party candidates. It's the Green Party. It's the Libertarian Party. The polls that are conducted where you got to get this 15 percent is just outrageous because that's controlled by the Democrats and Republicans and this debate board. But as far as Jill Stein's policies, everybody says her policies are going to bankrupt America. No. We start taking the money, of the subsidies that we pay to the banks, to the pharmacies, I'm sorry, to the pharmaceutical companies, and to Israel, we keep that money here, we reduce the uh, military budget by half, and we still by far have the strongest military, but we also need to stop fighting everybody in the world. But anyway, we, we take all those people who are in, uh, who um, manufacture uh, arms and warlike weapons, and we put them into green technologies so we can help the whole planet and help our country and get people into working. So people aren't going to be losing their jobs. But anyway, I thank you for taking my call. Jill Stein, 2016. Before you go, Chris, have you voted Green Party in the past? Supported the Green Party? I've always been independent. Okay. Thank thank you for your call. Catherine Sturgis, Michigan, on the independence line. Hi. I want the Democratic Party to know that I was a Democrat for over 40 years. I went, Bernie Sanders went out 
I was amazed. He was saying all the things that I've been thinking for years and years and years and was hoping I could vote for. Then we had so much what I'd like to say is election fraud that has not been discussed, discussed by the mainstream media. People that were taken off voter rolls, people that were de- put on, like in California, where they had to do some kind of provisional ballot. Who is discussing this? The only one that seems to be bringing it up is Trump. Well, Jill uh, in the Green Party, Jill Stein is who I'm voting for. And I have left the Democratic Party. I've left him because I have decided I am no longer going to vote for the lesser of two evils. And everything Jill says, when she says that Hillary does those things, that they're worried about Trump saying he's, you know, he says he's going to do certain things, she's right. Because we're just going to go into more wars. And that's where I just am so frustrated to think that we're going to be involved in more and more wars, creating more and more people that hate us. And we'll, all we have become is some kind of corporate Corp, corporate, I don't know, we're just into the corporate state. We are no longer a democracy. And when they say that's a two-party system, I've looked at other countries. They have a lot more parties than two-party. The two-party system is strangling our democracy. They're keeping it tight. But the problem is that both parties are so into corporations that they've forgotten about all of us out here that live a normal life. I am a teacher. And uh, I, uh, I'm out there, I see these kids that come to school, and it's a big, the haves and the have-nots, there's a big divide that's getting bigger and bigger. You've got kids that have everything and kids that don't have very much. And that's where our country's going. And I want to see this change. And I believe very strongly in Joe Stein. And the guy that came and talked about from Grand Rapids that said he's no longer voting for our senators because they went and put their votes even though our state went to Bernie, they put their superdelegate votes to Hillary. I am with him 100%. I'm not going to back those people. I'm no longer going to give money to the DNC because I'm no longer a Democrat. And I am going to back the Green Party. I'm going to look for Green Party candidates wherever they are. Catherine, how long have you been a teacher? Sen- Pardon? How long have you been a I've teacher? I've been a teacher... Well, I've been here at this school for 23 years, but I've been a teacher for, well... Let me see, 27 years. And what do, you, what do you teach? I'm an art teacher. Okay, thanks for your call. Next to Mike in Birmingham, Alabama. Mike is on the Democrats' line. Uh, yes, I like it. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I'm all, I've been a Democrat all my life. Uh, I think Bill Parton is not going to do what they say they're going to do, but I definitely don't want Trump to be in there. i like to thank you for taking my call. Okay. And Amanda. Amanda's in Round Rock, Texas. She's a Republican. I have been a Republican my whole life. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I believe that this is the year the citizens will be able to voice their opinion and really make it count um, because we now have Facebook, Twitter, all of these um, media channels that are not the television um, and um, paid for by the television. Um, I believe that it's time for us to take a very good look at the House, the Senate, and uh, make sure that uh, we have term limits put in. Um, Career politicians should not be allowed anymore. Um, It's not what the founders originally intended. You're supposed to have a job. If you did so, if you did well with what you did, you said, okay, well, it's time for me to give back. It's a civic duty. And you go to Washington to do something. And then you get out and you go back to your lives. You're not supposed to just ride and ride and ride. And, um, and we need to clean up the corruption. And we need to start voting in the affirmatives. Um, voting in the affirmative, uh, I will be voting for um, Gary Johnson. Um, I need to learn more about Jill Stein before I can say much more about Dr. Stein. Um, But I have read a lot about uh, Gary Johnson, and I believe they should all be at the debate. I believe that there should be more than a two-party system. The two-party system is like um, CTE to the United States, actually. Uh, It's making us uh, concuss ourselves into a strangled, paralyzed uh, mess. Thank you so much. Amanda, you said you're uh, crossing party lines. You're going to vote um, for uh, Jill Stein. Um, Uh, I'm I'm sorry. You said you were going to vote for Gary Johnson. I'm sorry. Uh, Have you ever crossed party lines to vote before during a presidential race? Uh, 
I have. I have. I, I've actually written in uh, Ralph Nader several times because I just couldn't see who was going to be on there. Um, but I also understand that right now, I'm, I I look at my family and I go, listen, if if you really want to make a change, don't hold your nose. Don't hold your nose and vote. Don't pull the party lever. Actually take a good look and vote for who you want to actually represent you. Thanks, Amanda. Our final call will be uh, from Torrance, California on the Independence Line. It's uh, Aaron. Aaron's calling from Torrance, California. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. I think I'm probably as guilty as everybody else. But my opinion, I haven't crossed line. I try to vote for the person. However, I think we spend too much time and energy worrying about the president, who, even though he's head of the country, has very little power. We need to some kind of way put a term limit on our congressmen. Those are the guys that sit there and make the majority of the decision. Uh, President can go in there with all these good ideas, but if he can't get Congress to follow him, it doesn't do much good. And we point the finger at the President. And I know right now the only way that he can change the rule that uh, those Congress have uh, a term limit, they have to be the one to do it. And we probably won't ever get that to happen. And until we get that to happen, it's going to be the same thing because I think both parties tell us one thing on TV and they probably go out to dinner together. So until we can do something about our congressmen, and each state will going to have to do it, put those in there that want to go and do something. And I thank you for taking my call. And we appreciate your call and uh, all the calls today. We're going to show you now uh, Jill Stein's remarks again from the National Press Club from uh, just a few moments ago. We will lead to it with pictures of President Obama.